Suddenly, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone, and sat on it. He said, Don't be afraid. I know you are looking for Jesus, who is crucified. He isn't here. He's risen from the dead, just as he said would happen. The conqueror, victorious king and lord over every living thing. They tried to reject him, but he couldn't be ignored. They tried to take him out, but he couldn't be defeated. They said he was dead, but they didn't know the ending. Mighty Savior, he reigns forever. Jesus is alive. Welcome to church. Uh, we're glad you've joined us, and we're, we're also glad that we can meet together online like this to celebrate the highest day in the Christian church calendar, that is Easter. Today is the day we celebrate Jesus Christ's resurrection from the dead. Um, he died and was crucified on Good Friday, and he rose from the dead early Sunday morning. If this is your first time watching, we want you to feel comfortable. As we worship in our homes, with our loved ones, or on our own, remember, we are worshiping with the entire Glad Tidings Church family virtually. So you can use the chat area to connect with each other and with your pastors. But most of all, remember this is the day we celebrate Jesus rising victorious over sin and the grave. i 
first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened.
you are alive today. Lord God, we serve a risen Savior. We can celebrate, Lord God. On Friday, you laid down your life. You gave it all for us. You bear our sins and our shame on the cross. But Lord God, today we celebrate because the grave could not hold you. We celebrate because, Lord God, death, it was nothing to you. We reflect with Paul the Apostle who says, death, where is your sting? And God, may we join in your death, but also in your resurrection to be alive, alive in you. So Lord God, we pray for life and life to the full. We pray, Lord Jesus, right now for any needs that we have. We plead the blood of Jesus. In Jesus' name, you come and minister to the sicknesses, the needs that we have, the emotional heaviness of this season. God, we pray that this is an Easter like no other, that we truly can understand the hope that we have the freedom that we have in Jesus. Lord God, the stone was rolled away and you came forth, you came bursting forth. You are alive. And because of that, Lord God, we can live. And we have a hope of a life beyond this, beyond what we see with our eyes right now, Lord God, a hope for a future. So Lord God, as we look into your word now, God, may the word of God just come alive to us. May our hearts just be awakened again, Lord God, to the truth of who you are, to the reality, Lord God, that you came to be our savior. You came for the lost and the broken and the sick, Lord God. You came to set captives free. So now, Lord God, that may death have no authority, Lord God, and we live in the freedom of who you are because you truly are alive. Alive. Well, he's alive, he's alive, he's alive today. He's alive, he's alive, he's alive today. And he reigns, and he reigns, and he reigns today. And he reigns, and he reigns, and he reigns. I grew up in Montreal. Montreal is an island in the St. Lawrence River. I was always fascinated as a young boy by the many bridges uh, that were used to gain access to Montreal, literally from every direction, north, south, east, and west. There are actually 28 crossings onto the island. Uh, two of those crossings are subway tunnels. Um, one is a vehicle tunnel for trucks and cars. The other 25 are bridges. Three of those bridges are dedicated solely to rail traffic. Uh, one is shared rail and uh, vehicles. And the 21 that are left are either just vehicle or vehicle and pedestrian uh, bridges. So there's quite a few bridges. My favorite bridge was the Jacques Cartier Bridge. Uh, probably because it was the one that I traveled on most as a child. It spans the St. Lawrence River. 
It goes from Montreal to St. Helens Island. And that's where the Expo 67 World's Fair was. So if ever we wanted to go there, or when we went to La Ronde, the amusement park, or when we traveled to our church Sunday school picnic that we had every year, um, that also was on St. Helens Island. So we had to take the Jacques Cartier Bridge. This bridge was impressive, uh, a big structure. And, and I remember when I was a little kid, I remember one day when we were crossing it, I asked my dad, what were all those green metal things above the bridge? Um, what was that all about? And my dad told me that those are the, the superstructure that supports the bridge. And I asked, okay, so how could the support be above the bridge? You know, I, I at least knew that you can't, you know, support it from above. You got to support it from underneath. And he explained to me the physics of a cantilevered um, expansion bridge and, and just how it works. And, uh, and, and they basically are supported by above. The roadway is supported from above. Now, the Oxford Dictionary defines a bridge as a structure that is built over a road, a railway, a river, etc., so that people, vehicles, etc., can cross from one side to the other side. Bridges can be simple or complex, supported entirely from below, like the permanent link that um, joins the mainland to Prince Edward Island, or uh, from above in the case of the Jacques Cartier Bridge, or even the world-famous Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. Now this morning I want to speak to you about another bridge. Not a bridge that crosses over a river connecting two pieces of land, but a bridge that crosses a large divide, a chasm, um, that without the bridge would be impossible to cross. The chasm is so large and vast that there really is no way for anyone to go from one side to the other side. The chasm is what lies between a holy God in heaven and sinful people here on earth. The story of the chasm starts at the beginning of the Bible where we read of God creating all that exists on earth and in the heavens. And on this one small rock that's flying around a star in the Milky Way, he put two people, Adam and Eve. The garden they lived in was literally perfect. There was plenty of food, nothing to fear, and they had a relationship with God. There was love and peace, trust and intimacy. But the chasm was created one day that the relationship between God and people was broken. It was ruined by Adam and Eve's disobedience, by their pride, by what we now call sin. Adam and Eve disobeyed God and in doing so caused a separation between people and God. And their disobedience caused every single human born from that moment on to be born with the same separation problem, the same sin problem, the same chasm that, that was fixed between people and God so that no one could cross and from one side to the other. It was larger than even the Grand Canyon. As people died, they died physically and spiritually. As more and more people were born, they were all, they were all faced with the same sin problem. Everyone was born sinful, and sin was the very thing that made this chasm so uncrossable. It isolated people from God and caused them to die. Die on this death on this earth came as a result of sin. Paul says in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. Uh, so not only the physical death that causes our bodies to wear out, but worse, the spiritual death that separated people from God forever. 
You see, all people were created for eternity, to live forever. As a result of sin, the chasm, people would die an eternal death, separated from God, an eternal torment we call hell. As people tried to span the gap before death, they came to realize that nothing was possible. Uh, nothing, nothing was strong enough to get them across. Nothing was long enough to get them across. Nothing was secure enough to help them cross from where they were to where God was. And, and people go on trying to bridge the chasm in various ways. One of the most impactful things uh, or lessons actually I learned um, from the many history courses that I took in high school and at college level uh, was this that uh, in general nation after nation leader after leader person after person learns nothing from history people witness others trying to make their way to, to bridge that chasm on their own and failing yet they try even harder than the last person thinking that they can do it They can reach the other side and have a relationship with God. But no one has. They try all sorts of things. One of the ways that people try to reach God is through religion. There might be, um, there possibly is, I I, I don't know, but I would would guess there's probably as many religions as there are countries in the world, and, and maybe even actually more than that. Religion or religious thinking is this. I can bridge the gap between me and God by trying to please him. So people do all kinds of religious things. They recite prayers. They fast. They light candles. They practice ceremonial rites. But the problem is, the Bible tells us that God isn't interested in our religious activities. He is interested in our heart. 1 Samuel 15, verses 22 to 23 is a fascinating story, and you you could read the whole thing in context, but, but Samuel is talking to the king, David, and he says this, What is more pleasing to the Lord, your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice? Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice, and submission is better than offering the fat of rams. Rebellion is as sinful as witchcraft and stubbornness as bad as worshiping idols. So you see this juxtaposition of of rites, religious ceremonies, and heart. God is interested in the heart. Religious activities in and of themselves do nothing to bridge the gap between people and God. Because we are all sinners. This failure of religion to bridge the gap between us and God is made real to us when we, when we read of very religious men and women looking righteous on the outside, still having terrible sin behavior and attitudes on the inside. Being religious does nothing to cross the great divide between us and God. Another way people have tried to span the gap is by living good. Thinking living a good life will get me to heaven. Personally, I've performed many funerals over the years that I've pastored uh, where families would tell me how good the person was, uh, you know, whether this person was a, a father or a mother or a child or a co-worker or a friend, you know, the accolades go on. And while no one, I don't think, has ever said that they were a perfect person, but almost all of them believed that they were good enough for God. God would overlook any negatives because of all the positives that that person had in life. They picture God kind of as having this big set of scales, and, uh, and the person's goodness is on one side, and the person's badness is on the other. And as long as the goodness is better than the bad, or you know, is, is, is outweighs the bad, then presto, the chasm is bridged. And those people are okay. I found an interesting quote 
Um, about what one person said about this. Let me read it to you. I asked myself what I believed. I had never prayed a lot. I hoped hard, wished hard, but I didn't pray. I had developed a certain distrust of organized religion growing up, but I felt I had the capacity to be a spiritual person and to hold some fervent beliefs. Quite simply, I believe I had a responsibility to be a good person, and that meant fair, honest, hardworking, and honorable. If I did that, if I was good to my family, true to my friends, if I gave back to my community or to some good cause, and if I wasn't a liar or a cheat or a thief, then I believe that I, that, that should be good enough. At the end of the day, if there was indeed some body or presence standing there to judge me, I hoped I would be judged on whether I had lived a true life, not on whether I believed in a certain book or whether I had been baptized. That quote is from Lance Armstrong. See, living good isn't going to be the bridge that will span that chasm because there is that sinful nature that Adam and Eve has passed on to us that resides deep within us. No matter how good our good deeds, our bad nature will trump it. The Bible in Isaiah 64 verse 6 says this, we are all infected and impure with sin. When we display our righteous deeds, they are nothing but filthy rags. Like autumn leaves, we wither and fall, and our sins sweep us away like the wind. Our imperfection does not ever come close to God's perfection, which is on the other side of the chasm. Of course, we should live good lives, But living a good life on its own can never overcome this sin barrier that caused this great chasm between people and God. And actually, these two things, religion and living a good life, by themselves will only result in death. We will remain separate from God because of our sin. But they seem to be like God things to do, don't they? And and they are. But they cannot bridge the gap between ourselves and God. On their own, they cannot. But there is a bridge that can span that chasm. And that bridge is Jesus. Jesus. God declared that death was the penalty for sin. He could not turn from that fact. He he couldn't just overlook our sin and forget about it because he is a just God. He is a holy God. And, And we still matter to him. He created us. He loves us. He couldn't stand to see all humanity separated from him forever. He knew we couldn't overcome our sin problem. So he did something about it. He sent his one and only son, Jesus, to our side of the chasm to live a sinless life, a perfect life here on earth. And then he hung on a cross and died, and he took the punishment of my sin on himself. But he didn't stay there. After three days... He resurrected from the dead. That is Easter. That is what we sang about this morning. That is what Carol read in the scriptures uh, for us. The story tells of a powerful connection that there now is between us and God because Jesus Christ died for our sins and rose from the grave. This bridge is now there. Jesus' friends went to the tomb and found that he had had been risen. 
in Luke 24, 6 to 7, uh, two angel-like beings told them, He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hand of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. On Easter, Jesus completed the bridge between us and God and became the permanent link. He became the bridge over the uncrossable chasm. Only God could pay the price he set for the penalty of our sin. So Jesus came to our side to pay the price with his death. And he sealed it by rising from the dead. Only Jesus was fully God and fully human, able to span the gap. And like a bridge, he has been or is on both sides. He's God and he's like us. He is on each side of the chasm and we can have a relationship with God because of his his resurrection from the dead. By rising from the dead, Jesus Christ demonstrated that he had cleansed the guilt of our past and he is able to help us in our present lives. His His resurrection assures us that our future is safe and secure. Without Christ's resurrection, we would have no salvation from sin and no hope for our own future resurrection and no hope of ever being able to cross the chasm between people and God. The chasm that sin, our sin nature, has left us. All we have to do to cross the chasm on the bridge Jesus provided is accept by faith his death on the cross and accept by faith his resurrection. Do this and you will have eternal life. So I want to close with a question on this Easter Sunday morning. A question that only you can answer. Have you crossed the bridge to eternal life through faith in Jesus? If you have never accepted Jesus and his sacrifice for you, taking your sin on him to become the bridge that makes you be able to have a relationship with God, I would like to give you a chance to do so. I want to pray for you. And, and I want us all, if you're alone at home, just repeat a phrase after me. But if you're in a, if everyone in your family or in your home there, uh, when I, I'm going to read a prayer and, and just everyone, let's all repeat it line after line uh, out loud so that no one feels uncomfortable. But if you've never accepted Jesus Christ and his death on the cross for your sin and his resurrection victorious over death, do that now as we pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I know I am a sinner. And I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and you rose from the dead I will trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior guide my life that I may live for you In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, please let me know by sending an email to uh, this address. 
I want to send you a Bible and get you connected with our church or another Bible-believing church near where you live so that you can grow in your faith. Remember, you're always welcome here at Glad Tidings. I trust that I hear from you soon. So thank you, everyone, for being with us this morning and joining us. And I trust that you have been inspired by the Holy Spirit. And if you have never done this, to begin that journey on the bridge that Jesus provided. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen.